My name is Neil Rosenberg. Tonight we're going to talk about the fish hatchery system in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, I work out of the Spooner office. I have about 25 years of uh, fish hatchery experience, worked quite a bit all over the state, believe it or not, in cold water and cool water fish species. So you'll learn more about that. But I want to lay this program out tonight. We have about an hour. We have about uh, seven or eight, nine of us in the room. Um, I want us to, this to be like an open format. So if you have questions, feel free to ask me. Um, if there was 35 people, we might do it differently, but this is a nice group. So uh, I've been chatting with a couple of you already. So I think what we're gonna do is start out and we're gonna talk about the whole statewide fish culture system. So, um, you'll get an understanding of what it looks like in the state of Wisconsin. And then I'm going to finish with a video of the Governor Thompson hatchery in Spooner, Upton Spooner. And that's going to be a detailed video, about 27 minutes. So, should we get started? Sure. Let's see if this works. I'm going to use this mouse. It's not working. We'll get it going here. Oh, let me see. I think you have to click this little a TV looking. Technology, yeah. It's wonderful when it works. We were just talking about some technology on fishing boats nowadays. And let me tell you, it's pretty impressive. Um, that might be one of the reasons we need hatcheries, right? So what do you think? What are some of the reasons why we need fish hatcheries in the state? Anybody know? Just throw out some answers. Yes, to repopulate fish. So why would we need to repopulate fish? What might happen? Freeze out. Yep, lakes freeze out once in a while. This, a good example was this winter was a bad winter for a lot of snow, over 100 inches up by Duluth. Yep, freeze out. What about if, um, say there's not good natural reproduction in the lake? And sometimes we have to come in and stock fish to get year classes. So what's some other reasons why we might need a fish hatchery? Well, like dam replacement. Oh, yeah. Like we had dam. Yeah. Structure. So the structure actually blocked fish is what uh, you're saying. Or no. once the dam was removed, we yeah. need to put fish in there. Absolutely. So introduction of fish, right? Introduction of fish. Good. Did you have? Yeah. Do you ever have like disease where they're? You know, something affected yes. the body. Yep, sometimes disease. Now, what's the current disease that kind of hit the landscape in 2007? Anybody know? VHS. Has anybody heard of that disease? Yeah. Viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Yeah. Basically, the fish internally bleeds to death. So, with that, we first discovered that disease down south in Wisconsin in 2007. And it kind of changed the way that we do business in Wisconsin and our hatcheries. But there's a couple other reasons just to keep the time moving. Lake Michigan, a good example. We stocked salmon in Lake Michigan. That was like a, a, a species that was not even known to live really in fresh water. It's an ocean run fish. And we stocked that in Lake Michigan and look at look at what that's done. I mean, just an incredible fishery. So um so I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to throw out some of the hatcheries. Art Empty Hatchery in Woodruff, Wisconsin. Anybody been there before? Did anybody know Art Empty? That's him in the picture. Art Empty was what we call Mr. Muskie. He did a lot of research in the Muskie um, field, and he worked at that hatchery for several years. He also lived in Spooner and worked. So, But the Art Empty Hatchery was built in 1901. They raise muskies, walleyes, and suckers. You might ask, why would you raise a sucker at a hatchery? Well, we use suckers to feed muskie and some walleye too. So it's just a forage that we can use. We can actually go out, we'll collect sucker eggs from the wild, bring them back to the hatchery, hatch them out, and use those fry to feed muskie and walleye in some places. All right, trying to advance. Um, this is what basically the hatchery building looked like in 1901. Pretty neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
couple round tanks out there. This is what the building looks like today. So if you've been there just recently, this is what you saw. We have a, there used to be an old uh, white pine in the front yard and the uh, Art Long is an artist up there in Arborvita and he came in and carved that up for us. Inside the hatchery is um, what you see it here. Are, these are hatching batteries is what we call them. Not like a battery you put in a flashlight. We call these batteries because they're a series of spigots and jars. I was talking to Ed about raising walleyes in a walleye wake, and he talked about putting fish in jars. And these are jars that you put eggs in. Um, water comes in at the top. Let's see if I can get really crazy here and use a pointer. I need like a third arm. So at the top here, water actually comes in and then it comes out these spigots down into the jars. The jars are turned upside down right now. There's no eggs, but so it's been operating like this for you know the last hundred years. The next hatchery is less void hatchery. Some people call it Bayfield hatchery. Anybody been there? If what's the most impressive thing about this hatchery when you went there? <laughs> Can you remember? In the visitor center, there's something in the visitor center. I'll let you think about it. There's the fish over there that this hatchery raises, brook trout, brown trout, lake trout, steelhead, a couple different strains of steelhead, splake. A splake is a cross between a lake trout and a brook trout. Female lake trout, male brook trout gives you a splake. Coho and then Chinook, those are the salmon. And Les Voigt was named after Lester Voigt, an American conservationist, and the first secretary of the Wisconsin DNR. Well, kind of a neat history there. His first position in state government was the director of the Wisconsin Department of Conservation. So it used to be called Wisconsin Conservation Department. And about 1968, 69, it became the Wisconsin DNR, Department of Natural Resources. But there's the old building. This is the front of the building. So there was offices up in the front and in the back of this building, there's rearing tanks. And that's where they do the lake trout. And they do lake trout for inland stocking also, along with um, Lake Superior lake trout. Just another picture. You can see the brown sandstone. That's real common up there in Ashland. Really neat. Isn't that the brownstone from uh, Stockton's Island? It could be. There's the back of the building. Wow. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah. 1896 or 97, I believe it was built. This actually is the new building. And this is the back of it. It's kind of, we're in the process of refinishing it, putting metal siding on it. Um, but inside this building is a series of uh, where this gentleman is working. These are small starter. In another part of the hatchery is where they actually incubate the fish eggs. So at this hatchery, they'll go out in Lake Superior, let's say, for lake trout, and they'll actually use uh, gill nets to capture the lake trout. They'll lay out gill nets, let them soak for an hour or two, and then bring them in, and they'll pull the fish out of the gill nets. The fish don't die. The fish stay alive. They put those fish in a holding tank, and then one of the hatchery guys is actually on the vessel. Uh, we have a research vessel called the Hack Noise is where this takes place. And they'll actually spawn the fish right there. The male, they will squirt the, the eggs in a pan from the female, squirt the milk from the, the male, and then fertilize eggs. They bring those eggs back to the hatchery in milk cans. Remember the old metal milk cans at farms? They still use milk cans there because of the, it's rough water. And milk cans really don't tip over in a boat because you have eggs and, and water in that milk can. So those eggs will come back, they get disinfected. We use iodine to disinfect eggs because we don't want a disease from Lake Superior to come into the hatchery. And those eggs will go up in, in jars or, or trays, I should say, they're called heath trays. So many eggs go in each tray. And when those fish hatch, they stay on those trays for a while because they have a yolk sac and they're absorbing that yolk sac. They don't have to eat yet. We call those sac fry basically because they have a sac their lunch sack is basically attached to them. But as the days go on, 
that yolk sac is, is absorbed and they start to swim up because now they're starting to look for something to eat. And we call those swim up fry. And at that point, they actually go in these tanks and they'll start feeding on dry pellet food. Trout and salmon are always fed. Like if you think about cat food or dog food, that's a dry type of feed. There's feed that's made for fish that's similar to that, but real small, small fish, small feed. The bigger the fish, you increase the size of the feed. And then there's big raceways over here. Once the fish get bigger, they move them from these starter tanks into these bigger tanks. So it just kind of gives you an idea. Here's what I was talking about. There's a huge aquarium, 3,500 gallon fish aquarium. Um, you can see the brook trout inside the aquarium, huge. And we just put a couple sturgeon in there about five years ago. So there's a couple four and a half foot sturgeon in there. It's a really neat place to visit if you're ever up by Bayfield. I used to work here. I put eight years of my career at this place, Black River Falls Field Operations. Anybody know anything about this? Black River Falls. Um, they do musky, walleye, and bass. Um, this is a picture of, uh, I'm trying to think where this is at. They have, let me just bring up the next picture. There's four outlying marine ponds. And if you're on Interstate 94, you're probably near Northfield. If you look to the north of the highway, like I said, it'd be kind of north. If you're heading towards Black River Falls, look to your left and you'll see one of these ponds and that's the Northfield pond. There's Bill's pond above that. There's a pond over by Colby. It's about 38 acres in size. That was built in the seventies to raise walleyes. But there's these outlying marine ponds and the folks that work at this facility also work with trout co-op ponds. And there's anywhere from 15 to 21 trout co-op ponds. The state actually will produce the small trout we, we take those to a cooperator that has a place to raise them. They raise those fish. They, it's mainly clubs. Um, what they do is they'll get some younger people involved. They'll buy the feed, they'll feed those fish, raise them up. And then when they go to stock them out, we'll come back with the fish truck. And usually that's a day when there's a school class that also comes. So it's a really a neat educational experience. When I work there, and I think they still do it, we go down to our rocket farm in Poinette. We call that the rocket farm. That's the pheasant farm. And we used to pick up pheasants. So this is a field operations unit. You do anything and everything. So it's kind of fun working there. You're just not strictly working with fish. Sometimes we drive dump trucks, Mack trucks, hauling rock to stream sites to do habitat work. And they do a lot of fish distribution, which that means we load fish on trucks and haul them out, stock them in lakes and streams and rivers. Here's a guy here that's, he's got a bag of fry, um, small fish in that bag, we call them fry. He's just tempering them, he's gonna release them. Oh, those the clays, yeah. those? No, those are closed to the public. Oh. Yeah, you know, most people would be like, well, God, it'd be fun to fish in a, a hatchery pond, but the fish are usually just too small, oh. yeah. This is Rural Rearing Station, built 1926. It was actually built by the WPA uh, program, the CCC. There was a CCC camp right next to the hatchery. Really a lot of neat work went into this facility. Um, there's two strains of brown trout that are currently reared here. Um, this is a picture, it's kind of hard to see. Um, there's a dam right here. Water goes over the dam. It comes down here and feeds these raceways. There's a series of raceways. And this is another bypass channel that goes down and feeds some of the ponds. So I don't know if anybody's anybody been up here to Brule, to this facility. Here's an aerial view of it. Um, I'm just trying to get my bearings here in my, looks like my, uh, my laser just petered out, but up top of the picture would be where the dam is and the water flows towards the bottom of the picture. You can see the series of ponds. They've raised trout here since the 20s. Uh, it was originally built and, and um, operated by a conservation club. So another picture of the raceways. 
So these are all raceways and water's flowing from the right to the left. So you can see the water coming into this pond. And there's fish in this pond. You can raise a lot of, a lot of fish at this facility. You can see in the picture on the left, the netting that covers the ponds because we got to try to keep the birds out of there. You get ospreys and blue herons. I mean, it's like it's like a, a smorgasbord. I mean, for birds and fur bears, raccoons. And, but you can see, I mean, a lot of educational programs go on there. That girl probably, well, she's pretty young, but I mean, those kids watching her clutch that fish will never forget that. So this Governor Thompson hatchery is just right up north here, about 50 um, minutes in Spooner. It was built in 1914. There was a series of three different buildings. Right now we're operating in a third building that was built. Um, this is an old picture. They do muskies, walleyes, and suckers, same as Art Key over in Woodruff. There's an old picture of what the facility looked like um, in 1914. Similar to, to the Woodruff hatchery, but up at the top right or top left would be those hatching batteries with the jars. These are double deckers, like a double decker bus. These, you can have two sets of jars, one on the bottom, one on the top. And there's 46 ponds at this facility. So like, right across from the Connemar. I mean, this hatchery is right in town. And most people don't realize there's that many ponds right in town. They're all rubber lined. They're, they used to be earthen ponds back in the day, but these are all rubber lined. And it's pretty much like a bathtub, filling them, draining them, fish go into a catch kettle. I was talking to a gentleman that said he's stopped here a few times and a visitor center wasn't open, but this is the top left picture would be the front of the visitor center. Um, if you park right off of 70, there's a parking lot the dam, the Spooner Dam's right there. You walk across the dam, there's a sidewalk. The sidewalk will take you right to the front of this. And inside we have aquariums and all kinds of fun stuff to look at. Kettle Moraine Springs Hatchery down in Adele. Um, this hatchery has been around since 1955. They do sam two salmon species and two uh, um, species of steelhead. Chambers Creek and Ganaraska, those are steelhead. Um, this is the facility that just recently, in the last five years, have, has gone through a renovation to a tune of about $26 million. You used to be able to do a lot of work for a couple million dollars. You can't anymore. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, you go to McDonald's, it's hard to order, or, or anywhere. You go in the grocery stores. I mean, price of everything has gone up, but this facility just got um, a renovation. This is what it looks like inside, brown tanks. This is what you call intensive culture. So some of those other pictures I showed you, like the Spooner hatchery, um, the trout hatcheries, those are all pretty much extensive hatchery. When you raise fish indoors, you put the fish out in the ponds. They're out in the ponds all summer. You feed them minnows, uh, trout, you feed them pellets. And then when they get the size that they need to be for stocking, we just harvest them and stock them. This type of system, fish never see the sun. They're reared indoors, they're reared in these tanks. It's a recirculating system. So you're using 90 to 95% of the water over again. You're only adding about 5% of new water. So you're really conserving water. Um, it's a way to really get these fish big and fast, but it's a hard system to operate because a lot can go wrong. There's a lot of moving parts. If um, the, the ammonia levels get too high because the biofilter is not working right, um, there could be problems. And they also have some new raceways in that picture on the bottom right there. You can see a truck backed up. Some of these pictures are a little fuzzy, but uh, these are some old upwelling jars at Kettle Marine. And they still may be using them, even though they have a new hatchery. This has been working for them since 1955. And if it's been working and we tweaked it and we tweaked it, we're gonna keep, if it's working, we're not we're gonna keep using it, we're not gonna quit. So these are salmon eggs or, or steelhead eggs in these jars. Lake Mills hatchery, about the same time, 1955, in Lake Mills, Wisconsin, rainbows, northerns, and walleyes. 
And it's basically that's the office. And below the office is the entry. Wow. <laughs> kind of weird, that's isn't it? Yeah. Um, they have a series of ponds on the property. And what you see here, and you'll see in the video when we play it, is this is a fish loader. Back in the day, I'm guessing uh, pre-2013, we would harvest ponds. Everything would go in the five-gallon buckets. And usually we would count. It depends on the facility. We would put 25 walleyes in a bucket, send that bucket up the steps. The guy in the truck that grabbed or gal grabbed the bucket would dump that bucket and make one mark on the truck. Mm. You know, one bucket, that's 25 fish. I need 24 more buckets to fill that tank. That's how we used to do business. And you would handle all the fish. You handle every fish. It was a lot of work. Um, I, I got a bad shoulder from it. And about 2013, we bought three of these units. And as you can see here, this hose, this is the intake hose, goes into a hopper. And these guys just crowd the fish into this hopper and the fish gets sucked just like a shop back you'd have in your garage up into this pump and the pump will then push the fish up this orange hose to that upper dewatering tower that's called a, a hopper up there that has a, a series of bar screens across and the fish will slide across those bar screens go out the white pipe that you see on the right and drop into the truck the water that went up there with the fish will actually come back down this black hose. See the black hose that's coming out the bottom? So the, the water goes through the bar grates and the fish go across them. Revolutionize how we do harvesting. You can harvest a pond twice as fast. You need less people. Um, we don't count fish anymore. The important thing with a fish loader is you have to do weight counts first. You have to be very accurate on what size fish are in this pond before you start because we use displacement now. So we know on our fish trucks that when that water rises one millimeter inside that tank, how many pounds of fish just went in there? And that depends on the size of the tank. So it's uh, when you don't have to count fish individually anymore, it goes pretty quick. And they also, um, inside behind that office house building, they, they made a room and they renovated it for intensive walleye rearing. So the walleyes are in these tanks. They never see outdoors. Um, actually, these walleyes are started outside, but they're brought in and put in these tanks and they're fed um, a pellet to feed. I think the next picture, you can see the walleyes. I think you can get a seven inch walleye in these tanks just in about five months. You can see how the eyes reflect. See how the walleyes, that's why they call them walleyes. Devon Hatchery. This is the oldest hatchery in the state that we own. The feds, I think the story I've heard, the feds owned it. They uh, sold it to us for a dollar just for the title rights. In 1876, it was started. They do brook trout, currently now brown trout and rainbow trout. Just an old picture. I like that cupola there on the right. But that's in Fitchburg, right? Kind of near, I mean, that's Madison, you know, Fitchburg. This is currently what the facility looks like. There's offices in this front part of the house and behind the house is the hatchery itself. You can see how much is the building and the top left pictures behind the house, but a lot of fish are reared outside. That's, that's the gentleman's there looking at the show pond. There's a fish with show pond um, fish in there, adult fish, I should say. Here's a, they have a couple ponds that they raise trout in. Same thing, you can see the hopper from the fish pump. That, that net with the corks that you see, that's called a seine. And we still use a seine at all hatcheries to capture fish or to crowd fish. When you're gonna do a weight count, you have to be able to net the fish and take samples of fish out of that net. That's a net that we use at all hatcheries, it's called a seine. If you smelt fish, you probably use a seine. That's what a seine is. Uh, they had a building that had a, a circular uh, raceway in it. They've taken that out since, but just a cool facility. And they also had some long raceways in that bottom picture that are outside. 
Osceola Hatchery. Anybody been over there? 1926. This hatchery goes way back. I think that there was a hatchery there in the 1800s. There was a uh, a big like a hotel there that people would come from the cities over here to Osceola. They'd stay there, and the gentleman that owned the place had trout ponds for people to fish. They also raised Great Danes at this place. So it was quite a hopping place back in the turn of the century. Um, we started leasing it from this uh, gentleman and then eventually um, bought the property in 26. But that's right in Osceola, Wisconsin, right? Kind of on the St. Croix River. Um, rainbows uh, and brook trout. So some of our uh, trout hatcheries actually have broodstock at the facility. So the, the parent fish are there. And usually there's two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and possibly four-year-old fish. And yes, some of those do get stocked out, those big fish. So when you ask, can we fish at these places? Now you're talking a place where this is tempting for some people. Because you go there to visit and you see these three-pound trout. And it's like, oh my goodness. And yes, people just recently at the one facility cut the fence got in and got some fish. But the, here's the problem. We've been feeding these fish pelleted feed and they don't taste very good. So when we stock these fish out, it takes probably a week or two for them to clear that out of their system. And then they start to taste better. I don't know if you've ever tasted trout, you know, pond or farm reared fish. They just have that off flavor. But it's getting better. The feed is getting better where you don't have that much anymore. That's the barn, I and mean, it's still there. That's what it looks like today. Inside the barn, that's what it looks like. There's there's tanks in there. I worked here for 11 months, and then I took a job down in Black River, but this was a fun place to work. Um, in the back, in the very back of the, the that back wall, there's jars where the eggs go in and get incubated. They hatch out, and then they go in these smaller tanks that are on the far side of the building, although those tanks are smaller than the, the ones you see in the foreground here. This is outside the building. There's outside raceways. So those, as those fish grow inside the building, they get bigger, you have to stock them outside. So then they go out to these, these long raceways. These are about 175 feet long, about uh, four and a half, five feet wide. They're only about 18 inches deep. The water starts up here. It's all groundwater. It's all artesian water. There's no wells here. If there's an electrical storm and the power goes out, the only thing that's affected are these aerators that are running that stir up the water. Other than that, the water keeps flowing. So it's a, a really neat system that was designed. Another thing that we do with this hatchery at a, at a few of our hatcheries, we actually have a feral trout program. So we actually rear wild trout. So we go out, this is Hay River or Hay Creek, and we work with the fish management program. So within the DNR fisheries, there's, there's several different types of programs. There's the management side, who you might, like if you wanna do tree drops or you wanna put a crib in your lake, you'd have to call the local DNR office find out who your fish manager is, you'd have to get a permit from them. They, they go out and survey the lakes. Fish culture, which is what I'm in, I supervise hatcheries in Northwest Wisconsin. We strictly, whatever the biologists request for quotas for certain lakes, we then look at those quotas and then we raise those fish. So that's kind of how that works. But in this type of program, we work together with fish management they actually go out with backpack shockers or with, it's called a small tub type of shocking unit. They'll shock the parent fish in this creek. Now, feral fish are pretty small, you know, seven, eight, nine inches, nine, 10 would be a big, big trout. And these are brook trout. And they, they'll put those adults in these cages. And we have these staked in stream. And this is on private property, so there's always eyes watching it. But when there's enough fish in there, they'll call the hatchery and say, come and spawn them. We spawn these fish, take the eggs back to the hatchery. We release the wild parents back into the water, but, but we take the eggs back to the hatchery, disinfect them, and then raise those fish. The problem is we can't get enough wild eggs 
out here. So we have to also raise a second generation of those wild fish at the hatchery. And we also spawn those at the hatchery to get us enough eggs and fish. But these fish are really wild. And you, you know, the difference is domestic fish, like the rainbows that we also raise at Osceola, those are domesticated rainbow trout. You walk up to them, they see you, they know you're gonna feed them, they come to you. These feral fish are very skittish. They act totally different. So a lot of times you have to cover the raceway with some type of covering so they are more relaxed. St. Croix Hatchery. So Osceola and St. Croix hatcheries are about eight miles apart. St. Croix is north up in St. Croix Falls. And this is the place where somebody just took some fish from us. But back in 1919, this facility was built and they do brook trout, brown trout. They also do feral fish here. Also that building that you see is the brook trout building. I'll take a look at that building, see how many windows are on there. This is what the building looks like today. So back in the day, there was no, there was basically no building here. There was just raceways in the ground. And they decided to put a cover over it and then they fill those raceways in and eventually put tanks in there. Uh, I don't know if I have a picture of that, but um, trout, a lot of times you're trying to rear early trout. They don't like light. So all those windows were not good. So we covered a lot of them up where we just hang garbage bags over the windows and try to keep the light out. This was just recently, I took a picture of this spring. The nice thing about this facility is there's a fence all the way around it, but sometimes that still doesn't stop people that want to get in. Um, where those, the original picture you saw a couple slides back were round ponds. That's where the round ponds were here. In the 60s, they took those out and put in raceways. And same thing, the water comes in this first one, it flows down and out. They're all kind of connected. So it's pretty neat how people engineered these type of hatcheries back in the day. That other building that you see is the, the brown trout building. And that's what that looks like inside. Those are concrete tanks. We're just about done. This is Wild Rose Hatchery down in Wild Rose, Wisconsin. This is our largest facility that we have in the state. And they raise, as you can see, look at all the fish they raise. Um, they do, the neat thing about this facility is they do cold water fish, which are trout and salmon, and they do cool water, which is muskie and walleye in northern, but built 1901, a lot of history, um, renovated about, ooh, 20 years ago, these ponds were all jug, and uh, the new building that we see down here in the bottom of the picture, Inside that building is um, raceways like you see here, incubation areas. There's round tanks where you can rear fish. They also have a really neat visitor center. They have a building that's just dedicated to the visitors. Um, they also have pavilions where they raise trout. You can see the raceways up in that picture, but they're covered by a building. That's nice because it keeps the sun off the fish keeps the birds and the predators off the fish too, which is really nice. It's just a more biosecure uh, way to do fish. There's a picture of what inside the visitor center looks like. I mean, this is just a little bit. It's really a neat place to visit. So one thing I wanna talk about, that's the hatcheries. If you were counting, I don't know if anybody's counting, there's only 11 fish hatcheries in the state of Wisconsin. Back in 1930, there was probably over 30. But we, what we did was we utilized a lot of cooperators also back then, but there was these little hatcheries that would pop up. Ed was talking about one on Long Lake. Hayward had a hatchery. A lot of these little towns had hatcheries. There wasn't much there, but they were, they were raising fish. But as time went on, technology got better. Some of these smaller facilities were phased out. Some of the stuff was moved from those facilities into other facilities to make bigger facilities. So 11 facilities right now. The unique thing is we have three weirs. And a weir basically is something weird. 
Because you know what is that? A weir is basically it's a it's it's set up on a river system. So along Lake Michigan, we have three three weirs, salmon weirs and steelhead weirs, where we collect fish. These fish will actually swim out of the lake up these tributaries. And we have one in Strawberry Creek. This is this facility. We have one in Kiwani and one down in Racine and on the Root River. So what happens is, and I'll explain in here, as the fish swim up the river, we have a low head dam. Dams are not good, right? But some dams are good, we need them. We have a low head dam, the fish come up and hit that, and then we divert those fish into our facility. Now salmon, how long do they live after they spawn? Do you know? Anybody know? For a week. <laughs> yeah, they die, right? They spawn once and die. So here's a salmon here. That's a big male, probably. It's hard to tell. It should have more of a kite on the bottom jaw, but it's dying. That fish is dark. If that same fish three, four weeks ago, you caught it out in the lake, it'd have been silver. So they run up into these facilities and die. And Strawberry Creek, we've had that since 1968. That's about the year the state of Wisconsin stocked the first salmon in Strawberry Creek. And this creek is where we introduced the first salmon to Lake Michigan. Didn't know what, what was going to happen. This facility is in Sturgeon Bay. Three, four years later, fish start coming back. And it was like, wow, this worked. The fish actually imprint on the water. This is what the facility looks like today. A lot of work has gone into it. We've fixed up some of the buildings. This is not a facility where people work at every day. This is only operated in the fall. And what happens is wild rose will raise the small Chinook salmon. When those get about two inches long, they bring them to this facility where there's a pond. And it's about 30 feet wide by 60 feet long, I believe. This is what the pond looks like. And they, they actually rear these fish in there. They actually pay a cooperator. Actually, we don't pay them. The cooperator actually volunteers his time to come and feed the fish once or twice a day. And we hold the fish here about 30 days, 40 days. They start to get silvery, and that means they're smolty. When salmon starts to smolt, that means they're ready to run out, get out of the creek and go to the ocean. Well, they're not going to the ocean, they're going to Lake Michigan. So what we do here is in the middle, well, the picture, and I, I would show you, but I don't have my pointer, but right here is like a weird thing. We will open that up and we start to drain the pond and all those small four inch fish will go out to the lake. And we tell them we'll see you in three, four years. And that's what you're seeing here. Has anybody seen this facility operate in October? It's worth going there. It's really cool. You'll get a thousand to three thousand fish that show up in this pond, and they naturally just um, because the lake is lower now than it used to be thirty years ago. We have to actually pump water from the lake up above this facility, so we we create a creek. We have to maintain a certain level of water in Strawberry Creek. Because those fish have imprinted because they were reared here, they imprinted on this water, so they come back to the same spot. And that's what we're doing here. We're capturing the fish and they go up in that basket and we process the fish. Management is there actually collecting data like length, weight, sex, looking for different clips. This is where you see sea lamprey marks once in a while. Sometimes we'll, cap we'll capture sea lampreys still stuck on the fish. And then the hatcheries spawn the fish. We actually take the eggs from the fish, spawn the eggs, fertilize them right here at this facility. We disinfect them, water harden them here. Then they get, they go back down the wild roads. Um, what you see in these totes are fish that are pretty much going to go to fertilizer. They're not worth eating. They're they're too big to be consumed. Uh, fish that are actually under a certain size that look good, we throw them on ice and the food pantry in Green Bay, and there's about two other food pantries that get all these, these edible fish. So none of them go to waste. Um, they're either turned into fertilizer or they're eaten. These fish are dead. This fish is dead that's hanging here. Um, the gal just stuck a needle that you would use to blow up your soccer ball or basketball and shot some air in that abdomen of the fish. And it, the eggs are, uh, 
come right out like easy into a bucket and then they're fertilized. And what you see on the right there is just a batch of eggs that's water hardening. Wow. About two hours they water harden and then you can transport them back to the hatchery. They're also disinfected here before they go back. So just south of there in Kiwani is our other weird, it's called the Buzz Basadi. They do Chinook, they do a few more things. It's a backup facility for Chinook. Strawberry Creek is our number one facility for Chinook salmon, egg take, but we do also take some Chinook eggs from here as a backup. Steelhead plus coho. This is a facility that was built in the 70s, I believe, and I have the wrong, it's Kiwani on Sturgeon Bay. It's a neat, pretty neat facility. You can see the Kiwani River at the top of the picture, see that? Yeah. And here's a series of concrete ponds. And we want the fish from the river. Actually, the fish come from the lake up the Kiwani Harbor. Up this river, they hit the weir, they swim up our fish ladder, and they go into these ponds. We can actually control how many fish we want in each one of those ponds. And this is a good picture. You can see there's like a raceway right here. So we can push all those fish out of a pond into this raceway here and push them into the building. There's a series of elevators in the building that bring the fish up into the workspace so we can work them up. Here's another picture of what those ponds look like. So here's, here's the creek. See the water's flowing down. Fish will come up and they swim up this into this little weir and they go through a series. It's a, basically a fish ladder. The fish are jumping and making their way up. On. It's hard because I got to roll the mouse. Here's another picture. So there's the weir. There's the weir in the Kiwani River. Fish come up and they they're attracted to this flow of water right here. That's what that fish is doing. That's the picture, a zoomed up picture of right here. That fish is jumping and he's gonna make his way up this creek into the facility. It's a pretty cool place. This also has a viewing window where you can walk down in there and actually see the fish swim by. There's a big glass wall. You'd stand there for now to watch and I know. That would be cool. So once the fish are inside the building, same thing happens like at Strawberry Creek. The fish are weighed. That's what the gentleman's doing here in the middle. The fish are weighed, um, sexed, length are taken. They're looking for tags. You know, on these these fish that have been hatchery reared, trout have an adipose fin, a little fleshy thing back here. You don't you no, notice that one's gone, right? So when you catch a salmon that doesn't have an adipose fin, that is a hatchery raised fish. That means this fish was has a wire coated tag embedded in its snout. The, the the federal government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, actually has a trailer that goes around. It's called a mass marking trailer. If you Google it. There's some pretty cool videos. They'll pump these fish when they're pretty small, like an inch and a half long, into this trailer. And the trailer is automated. It automatically cuts that off, inserts the tag, and spits the fish out another pipe. It's a pretty cool thing. Back in the old days, we'd have to do all this by hand. <laughs> Same thing, though. These fish go to the food pantry. And lastly, before we get into the video, this is the furthest south uh, weir that we have. It's called the Root River down in Racine. And it's the same thing. It's basically just an on-man facility in the fall. We have staff that go there and collect fish. A lot of times, too, in the spring. You know, some steelhead run in the spring, so we're there in the spring. Same thing with this facility. They also have a viewing window. Um, yeah, here. Like I was telling you, the fish come up into the facility and then the employees have to crowd them into certain areas. They also have an elevator. That's kind of their elevator. They'll lift it up and then the fish will come out on the table, the workup table, we call it to be worked. But that's pretty much the state of Wisconsin fish culture system at about at a 30,000 foot flyover. I don't know if you guys have any questions on that before we jump into the video or 
Any questions on any facilities that you saw? Or? So if a person wanted to go up in the timing to go take a jack up to see one of those facilities, yeah. is it on the website or would we know? Yeah, it would be any time in October. Okay. So usually the first part of October is the best. You could call the DNR hotline yep. and ask them if salmon are running up at. No, not now. Just visit the other. Yeah, so this spring they had a little activity with some steelhead the spring run, but everything usually happens in the fall. Okay. September, usually right at the end of September, but usually October is when you want to go. Okay. From egg to release on most fish, how long does that take? Um, yeah, it actually at the cool water facilities that do muskies and walleyes, we go out, we capture the fish, and you'll see that in the video. Um, five, five months. So you can have an egg to a 13 inch muskie in five months. You can have an egg to a walleye in about four and a half months and the walleye is seven inches. Um, sturgeon take longer 